Last time we did item encoding with hoppers as our filters. Now we're going to start working on double chests as our filters. <clears throat> I've also reorganized the world and labeled a bunch of different encoders and written out their encoding schemes just so we have a lot of concrete examples to look at. As a reminder, we're making a machine that takes in an item from a given list of items and then outputs a binary code which represents that item. So here we throw in the fence gate, we turn the machine on, and it outputs the uh, spruce fence gate code. The way we do this is we put our spruce fence gate in a hopper minecart, clog up the rest of the slots, and pass it underneath a bunch of filters. And here the code for a spruce fence gate is 010110. And what that means is these three filters that you know have a one as their output bit have a spruce fence gate in them somewhere yeah so there's one and then these two yep should also have a spruce fence gate in them yep sure enough and then the other three chests don't have any spruce fence gate in them for reloading the hoppers it was a bit easier because once we were done we took our hopper minecart and just passed it over the top of them here we have to be a little bit more clever so what i've done is i've added a row of target blocks here which are normally powered, so they lock all the hoppers here. However, if an item is removed from the filters, you can, so you can see most of the items in here, there's four of them, but Spruce Fence Gate only has three because we just sucked one out of the uh, chest here. That causes the comparator in here to decrease in signal strength, unpowering this target block. So now, when we send the hopper minecart back over, it'll drop three spruce fence gates perfectly back into the three chests that spruce fence gates were taken out of. So that's the mechanics of how we're going to be doing double chest encoder filters. For terminology, an item encoder refers to the circuitry itself, the machine and the redstone blocks that make it up. An encoding scheme refers to the list of codes that that machine outputs and which items you've matched up with which codes. Our first task for this video now is to take the concepts we got our heads around for these small examples here with hoppers as our item filters and scale those concepts up so that they apply to double chest. So when we were doing a three bit item encoder with hoppers as our filters, we were able to use every code because it only required having at most four items in each of our filters. But when we bumped up to four bits, we ran into a problem. A hopper can only hold five distinct items, but to use every four bit code would require having eight items in each hopper. So we have to handpick a selection of four bit codes, including some in the possible output of our encoder and excluding some. These four codes here, the ones marked with red, uh, will never be produced as an output of this encoder. By the way, you might see these like different kind of wool block setups here. Um, one of the problems with, you know, scaling up our encoders so that they can encode hundreds of items. Now our encoding schemes are like 300 blocks long if we write them out in full. So uh, one of our tasks this video will be to get our heads around a different notation for writing out our encoding schemes. So this rectangle of wool blocks here represents an encoding scheme where I've just written out every code individually. This is the same encoding scheme, but here each row doesn't represent a single code, but actually a family of codes. In the same way that when we jumped up from three bits to four with hoppers, we had to start excluding codes. That happens when we jump up from six bits to seven when we're using double chests as our filters. And the reason is exactly the same. A double chest has 54 item slots inside of it. And if you're using six bit codes, you can use every single code and it only requires having 32 items in each of your filters. So if you count up all the white wool blocks here in each column, there would be only 32 white wool blocks or 32 tokens they're sometimes called. With seven bits we would have to have 64 items in each of our filters to use every seven bit code so now we have to start excluding codes. This is actually going to be a really good example to look at. So last time instead of writing the codes out in like the standard binary order that you might have seen for you know writing out binary numbers I grouped them into uh, clumps based on how many tokens or how many ones were in those binary codes. So here's all the one token codes, two token codes, three tokens, four tokens, and uh, for five bits, there's only a single five token code. And I said that ordering them this way helps us 
use our filters more efficiently. And here's a really good example of why that is. So this is a seven bit encoder. We can't use every code. How do we pick which codes we use and which we don't? And what I did here was I wrote out in full three different methods of picking which codes your encoder can output and which it can't. On the left here, I've simply included the codes in their binary ordering. So I started at the top here, you know, added code after code until one of the filters hit the maximum capacity of 54 items and I had to stop. In the middle here, I've done the exact same thing, but uh, using the token like clump ordering. So I started with the one token codes, then went to two token codes, three tokens, four, um, all the way down to five. And five is where you have to stop because there's not enough room to include every five token code. Um, so also today we're going to talk about how to pick codes with a specific number of tokens in a way that's a little easier to remember than just like randomly hand picking 12 of them. And lastly, this, this was the worst option of all. I picked codes in a random order to spread a Python program to shuffle them. There's 128 seven bit binary numbers. So 128 possible seven bit codes using the standard binary ordering. We only got 109 out of those 128 possible codes. But with grouping by token count, we can squeeze in 115 codes. We actually get more codes out of the same machine without increasing its size. And lastly, for random, we don't even get 100 codes. It, we get 99. One way I found that makes this whole like code subset selection easier to think about is to imagine that all these binary codes actually have a weight to them. So the codes with a lot of tokens are heavier and the codes that have very few tokens are lighter weight and your filters can only hold a certain amount of weight so you can fit more codes into your filters by loading them up with the lightest weight codes first and excluding the heaviest codes so i've labeled all the encoders here too um, you've probably noticed these numbers here the oak wood marks how many bits that encoder outputs so this is a seven bit encoder the andesite number marks how many codes this machine outputs so it's not going to be the full 128 because we can't fit all 128 codes but we can fit in 115 and then the top number just tells you what percentage of the maximum this middle number here is so 115 um, it's about 90% of 128. By the way, I haven't set up most of these encoders. I did set up the six bit encoder here. So this actually like properly encodes 64 different uh, wood items of some kind. That took, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes. And this was the smallest encoder. So <laughs> I decided I wasn't willing to take the, you know, three or four hours it would take to set up all of these encoders. You can see the uh, thumbnail shot over there. That's everything we have to say for scaling up from hoppers to double chests. There we had to start hand selecting codes at four bits. Here we have to start hand selecting codes at seven bits. So if you're encoding about 100 items or less, this will pretty much do whatever you need it to do. You're still getting 90% usage of the code space, 90% usage of all the possible codes that could be produced with that many bits. Now we're going to encounter a new problem as we start scaling up again. Our goal is to encode every stackable item in the game. I think there's like 800 something currently. So here I've started increasing the size of the encoder by adding new bits. And for 8 bits, we can squeeze in 143 uh, codes, again using the token ordering. So for 9-bit codes, we can get 168 distinct codes out of the machine. For 10 bits, we get 196 codes. Here's where you might start noticing the problem. At 7 bits, we were still getting 90% usage of the code space of all the possible codes. Now we're down to 56%, then 33 then 19. Past 10, I stopped writing out the full scheme and just use my compact notation for encoding schemes. It gets worse and worse. So I think by, yeah, by 16 bits, just using the same approach, you can get, you know, over 300 codes out of the machine, but now you're using less than 1% of all possible 16-bit codes. It's funny because now we've come full circle. You remember this was the same reason we rejected the naive encoder right here. So the naive encoder was to use one filter per item. So we had eight bits, eight items, which worked, but was kind of bad because we're only using 3% of all the possible eight bit codes. The reason you would want to optimize this is the better use you can make of the code space, the more compact and the faster your encoder is going to be, and the more compact and faster all the machines that depend on the encoder are going to be. Okay, we should probably bite the bullet now and just go ahead and um, 
interpret what this new uh, notation means for encoding schemes. So we'll start with the 8-bit encoder here. <laughs> it uses every one token code, every two token code, and every three token code, then at four tokens. Now we start hand selecting codes. We don't really need to write out every one, two, and three token code. It'd be enough, at least as far as like representing this encoding scheme goes, to just signify that we're using every one, two, and three token code. So that's exactly what the cyan wool here marks. So I'm going to be using blue cyan to mark which codes we're using every code of with that token count. So this row here doesn't represent one, 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 zeros. This row here represents every three token code. When it comes time to actually, you know, sit down and load up all the filters with the items you're encoding, then you would probably want to actually write out the code in full, but you probably wouldn't want to use Minecraft itself to do this. Probably just a spreadsheet would be a better bet. And then now it'd be nice if we had a more compact way to write out which four token codes we're selecting. So we're not taking every four token code, but there's a trick here that'll help us remember more easily which four token codes we're including and which we're not. And that's to use rotations of the same code. So here, if you know, we start with a code that just has four ones in a row, we can rotate it one to the right, one to the right again, and just kind of keep shifting it over and then kind of like Pac-Man style when it starts running off the edge of our eight bits here, we just wrap it around back to the other side. And here, we have eight different codes, each one of them with four tokens in it, or four bits are ones. And one of the reasons taking these rotation families is a lot nicer is, well, one, they're easier to remember, but secondly, they add the same number of items to each filter. So our leftmost filter uh, will have one, two, three, four items added by this whole family to it. The second to the leftmost filter will have one, two, three, four items added in so on and so forth. So it's nice because it kind of increments the capacity of our filters by the same amount instead of, you know, some filters bumping up ahead of others and it just gets harder to keep track of in your mind. And so what I've done here is I've included six rotational families. So none of these six families contain any of the same code. They're all distinct, uh, but each one can be represented just by the single code we're starting with. So that's the second segment of this compact notation. Each of the magenta wool blocks here marks not a single code, but a family of codes created by rotating this initial code uh, one to the right, wrapping around eight times. So this cyan uh, code right here doesn't represent a single code, it represents the family of every three token code. This code here is a little different, so this magenta binary number here doesn't represent every four token code, it represents the four token codes you get by taking four ones in a row and then just rotating them one to the right until you wrap back around to where you started. So we have 8, 16, 24, 32, 40, 48. And then uh, it turns out that actually after adding in all these families, there's still little space left in our filters. You can work out that uh, these three families of codes, so all the one, two, and three token codes, in total add 29 items to each of our filters. So the first 29 items in here would be contributed by our cyan families of codes. The rotation families, each one of those, like I showed over there, contributes four items to each of our filters. All the three token codes added were at 29 items per filter. Then we go up to 33, 37, 41, 45, 49, 53. And the max capacity is 54, so we actually still have space for one item in each filter. Lastly, the yellow codes here, these, these aren't families of codes. These just represent single individual binary codes. And if we add in these two here, 11001100, and then the same code actually just with the ones and zeros flipped, it adds one item to each of the filters. The encoding scheme marked out right here is kind of cool mathematically because it uses the capacity of all eight filters at perfect 100%. By the way, just so that we're not confused, the percentage capacity of the filters being used is not the same as the percentage of codes being used. So this thing uses 100% of the capacity of the filters with this encoding scheme, which I haven't set up because I wasn't willing to put in the time to set it up like I did for that one, but it only uses 56% of all possible 8-bit codes. And then the same thing that I've done here, you can work out for 9 bits, 10 bits, exact same thing. So you're including 1, 2, 3 token codes, and then 
a hand selection of rotational families of four token codes. Uh, by the way, if you were viewing these codes in like the environment of group theory, as you know, permutations applying higher algebra to this, you would call these families the orbits of a single code under a permutation. For a 10-bit encoder, uh, we can still fit in every one, two, and three token code, and that actually brings us up to 46 items per filter. So we're already pretty close to their full capacity. So it only takes two of these four token rotational families. I think this is also actually a perfect uh, filter capacity encoder. So there's no unused slots in our item filters with this, but it is only using 19% of all possible 10-bit codes. And then lastly, I took the time to write out this abbreviated encoding scheme for every amount of bits from 11 through 21. At 11 bits is where now you actually can't include every three token code. So if you have 11 double chess filters in your encoder, using every one, two, and three token code would I think require 57 items per filter. It's just barely over. So we got to include a lot of these rotational families. And now the rotational families, they're only a three tokens each, because we're selecting a subset of the three token codes now. By the way, there's actually a cool math pattern to these encoding schemes here. Oh, I forgot to do that one. But if you look at the yellow sections, they actually repeat every three number of bits. So for instance, we have thin line, no yellow section, thick line. And then same thing again, thin line, no yellow section, thick line in the yellow section, and then that actually keeps going. I think that keeps going up until the point where you have so many bits that the one and two token codes alone are enough to exceed the filter capacity. Then I also went back and wrote out the old encoding schemes using the new notation. For six bits, we just include every code. So every one, two, three, four, five, six token code. And then for seven bits, we include every one, two, three, four token code, two rotational families, and then two individual hand-picked codes. Here's the abbreviated scheme for the hopper encoders we covered earlier. I know that's really tedious, but I found that having a smaller notation for coding schemes has been really helpful to study concrete examples of them. Okay, so where are we now? We have a pretty good encoder that works up to 100 items, but the new problem is that the code percentage drops down to 1%, you know, at 300, 400 items, and we're trying to get up to like 800, 900 items. Last time I talked about the purpose of these encoders being item retrieval from bulk storage, and I kind of introduced it through three steps of increasing complexity. Now we have a fourth step of complexity that we're gonna have to solve. For large encoders that can do 500 or more items, so we're gonna first encode our item. We're gonna get a really long code that only has like two or three tokens in it. And now we're gonna need to come up with a way to compress this down to something smaller so that by reducing the number of bits in our final code, we're using a much higher percentage of all the possible codes available with that number of bits. You could just send off this big long one and work with that, but now your decoder is gonna to have to be three or four times as long and it's gonna take longer to send that code off to wherever it needs to go. That's the problem we're gonna tackle next time. Thanks for watching.